welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Well, we're back in Aurora, Illinois at the GAR Hall and Museum for another episode. Today we're going to talk about a very common musket that was used during the Civil War, the Model 1816. With me today are two brothers, Mark and Jason Kraus, who run a historic arms collector company called Agents Pelican and Campbell. Let's get started. Before we get to the 1816 muskets, Mark, let's talk for a second. Why did the Army build an 1816 musket? Following the Revolutionary War, there needed to be um, an arms production market in the United States, and there was very little um, commonality among all the producers. There's variations within variations. And it got to the point that in 1815, there needed to be some sort of standardization between all the different makers and models of the muskets. Mm -hmm. And that began the 18th story of the 1816. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Wadsworth, who's commander of the Ordnance Department, is penning A.J. Dallas. Rather than try to fix the problems and uniformity of the predecessor, he decides to kind of start new with a brand new musket and based on certain criteria that he establishes. And that begins a production of model muskets beginning in 1816, but production really doesn't start until 1817, 1818. Okay, so we see that the Ordnance Department is going to build a new musket in 1816. You guys told me before we started shooting that there's three variants of this. Mm -hmm. Tell me about them. Correct. You started off with this 1816 Type 1. The most distinct feature of this National Army bright weapon was a separately attached swivel stud for the sling that a soldier would carry the weapon by. This separate attached swivel stud is the most distinct feature that most historians, collectors, and reenactors know the 1816 Type 1 by. Then they decided to produce a, a conjoined swivel stud along with the um, trigger guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Type 2 that you see here is a National Armory Brown. They did this for roughly 10 years, from 1820s into the early part of 1830s. And the biggest feature is you see that rust browning before you. It's got a very definitive feature to it versus the uh, earlier version, the Type 1, that was bright. It also has all browning on its hardware as well. Later in the 1830s, they produce a bright version of almost the same weapon that you see this brilliant shine to, and that's the National Armory Bright. They went back to the first version for their finishing touches. And that makes the Type 3. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay, so if we take the Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3 and take the Model 1816 musket in total, mm -hmm. about how many do we have sitting by the time of the Mexican-American War? They had produced at this point roughly 960,000 of these weapons for state militias, local militias, as well as the United States Navy and the United States Army. Okay, so if you've got a million things sitting around and one portion of it changes, we're going to start using the percussion system to fire the weapon because it's more reliable than a flint system. Obviously, the government decided not to throw out a million muskets. Correct. Correct. With that, with the 1841 uh, rifle that was produced, that we know as the Mississippi rifle and the Model 1842 musket, those were the first percussion cap U.S. long arms. And so the United States decided to go to this percussion cap system with all of these million plus flintlocks that were laying around the armories and arsenals and so forth. So they just had a competition of sorts between a Belgian style of alteration and a French style of mm -hmm. alteration. The Belgian style of alteration called for a cone that was directly screwed into the breech block of the weapon and because it was a, such a simple design and cost effective, that design won out. Great. So, okay, you're going to drill a hole into the top like this weapon here. What happened to the old, oh, what happened to the old vent hole from the flint? Good point. They would actually weld that hole close, which, when the United States went over to a rifled musket, presented a new problem because that was a weak spot in these muskets. So why don't we want to use the Conan, or why does the Army move away from the Conan conversion? The Army moves away from the Conan conversion because when they were rifling these barrels to take mini ball ammunition at that point, the barrels were blowing up because the caliber of ammunition was no longer .65 round ball, that was 410 grains, it was now .685 caliber, 
and 720 grains, meaning that this was nearly double the size of the original ammunition type, and as such, it would also cause such tremendous pressure in that breech uh, of trying to propel this mini ball down the barrel that the breech couldn't withstand the pressure and would blow up. So what did they do? They came up with something known as a chamber breech alteration. A chamber breech alteration is a plug that already has a vent, uh, cone with vent, that would screw into the barrel and reinforce you know, that weak spot of the barrel by thereby create a whole totally new piece. And you can see the distinct feature of those types of alterations by a line that goes around the barrel where this new plug sits into the barrel. We've seen the cone in, we see the drum bolster. As I look at the back two, I see another form of conversion. Tell me about what this is. Okay. Well, you'll see here are two different drum bolster conversions. It was done by attaching a drum to the side where the vent hole was and screwed in. That was another way that was altered both by state arsenals um, and civilian contractors. Great. And this forward one, uh, Mark, tell me about that hammer. That looks different than all the other hammers here. This hammer is a hand forged hammer that's very distinct in the years pre prior to the Civil War of a civilian style, but also in the first years of the war of Confederate cottage industry um, alterations. So it pr is presumed that this could possibly be either a civilian gun or possibly a Confederate alteration for the war. But we have no way of knowing no for way sure. No positive. Well, as I look across the table, the musket closest to us is the most unique of the bunch. Would you tell me about it? Sure thing. This is the 1854 Russian contract Colt alteration. Samuel Colt, that we most notably associate with revolvers at the time, was contracted by Russia to produce 50,000 of these alterations. However, he, Colt only got to about 25,000 that we can assume and he could not deliver these in time for the Crimean War. So what did he do with them? With these, he had about these 25,000 that we presume that he, that he altered. His brother-in-law at the time was an was a agent in London. He, we believe his brother, went to the Italians with prototypes, showed these to Giuseppe Garibaldi, who was then fighting a war for Italian independence, Italian unification, and these 25,000 end up with Garibaldi. Now, the history after that point gets even murkier in that we don't really know what happened to a lot of those guns. We can assume that some of these made their way back to the southern states or New England states who were buying up surplus weapons from Europe. Long story short, all these alterations, very few of these actually survived, mm -hmm. but we, can, we think that some of these made their way back into the the United States for the Civil War. Great. Well, as we finish up, go ahead and tell me a little bit about the technical portion of this weapon. What am I looking at? The technical portion of this weapon is you'll see a smooth board that was rifled. Samuel Colt then added a drum bolster that was very distinct to Colt. He had in it, if you look carefully, you'll see Colt's patent across the face as well as a clean-out screw. There is a European-designed sight as well as an Enfield-style hammer that he added to this weapon. And you'll see 1854 is stamped prominently on the lock plate. You'll also see that this is a 69 caliber rifle and a distinct ramrod is of European design as well. So this is a weapon that we know is part of the 1816 Correct. family, but probably mm -hmm. very few of these saw service in the Civil Correct. War. Correct, absolutely. Well, thanks, fellas, for bringing this to us mm -hmm. very much today, for bringing your wealth of knowledge and just what a wonderful collection of weapons, whether it's the Type 1, Type 2, or Type 3 of the original Model 1816, whether it's the cone in, the chamber breech, or the drum bolster conversion as they brought them from flintlock to percussion. There's a lot to see and learn yes. here. For the Civil War Digital Digest, I'm Will. If you've enjoyed the episode, please hit like and share it out to your friends. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. <laughs>